Has it ever bothered you that the Lord blesses those that y'all don't agree with? Amen? Maybe the Lord just lets them skate by a little bit, and you think that that ain't right, right? They, they deserve something else. But here's the, here's the issue that we've got to face and got to know and believe and follow. God is love. I mean, purely, there is no shadow of turning. God is love. And he wants us to be loving too. And he doesn't give us a choice about who we're supposed to love. He defines that, Jesus actually defines that in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, verse 44, let me read some words to you from our Lord and our Savior. But I say to you, love your enemies. Now the word love there is agape, that means to cherish. That means to place in high order. That means to place yourself under them but to find value in them, by the way, you might have to hunt for it. But God loves them, and God sees value in them as well. And God loves them, and God expects us to love them too. And you may not call them your enemy, but they may call you their enemy. So that means that there's still a war going on. So into that frame, he says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. That's the opposite of the human reaction, is it not? Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be sons of, the, of your Father in heaven. For he makes this, this, his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now that's God who never makes a mistake. He wants there to be a level playing field. So a person, if, if Christians always received blessings when others did not, people would want to be a Christian simply because of what they could get from it, not because they love God. So he's, he, lets it, he lets the sun come up on the good and the evil. He lets uh, it rain on the just and the unjust. It might surprise you, but you don't get to choose who to be nice to. Well, you say, oh, yes, I do. Well, you may, but yet God wants you to be like Christ in every circumstance with every person out there. You know what I love about the Old Testament? One of the great things about the Old Testament is we get to see stories about real people with real problems who find real solutions. We get to, to live what's going on in their life. And we get to see who God is there and what's going on. In Psalms 46, it was written um, when King Hezekiah was king of Judah. Now, there, there's a couple of phrases here I want to, 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 for us to talk about right off the bat because I don't want you to be confused. During this particular time, uh, Israel was divided. There were the 12 tribes, but 10 of the tribes, the northern tribes, had broken away. And they had uh, aligned with their own king. And they had fallen into idolatry. How many of you know God doesn't like idols? How many of you know God's not going to bless sin? And yet sometimes we're, we're, we're not too good that because we look at it and we think God does bless sin. Or sometimes it may look like God's just giving a wink and a nod to things that are evil that are going on. Some say this was written by Hezekiah. Some say that it was written by Isaiah. As a matter of fact, when you go to Isaiah 38, you're going to get almost a verbatim look at Scripture that we see in 2 Kings. It's almost identical. So it could have been Hezekiah. I actually believe it was King Hezekiah. It could have been Isaiah, or it could have been some other poet or some poet laureate that Judah has. Now, the ten northern tribes, they had broken away. But Judah was in the south. Hezekiah was their king, and Jerusalem was their capital. So there was this city to the north, a land to the north, called the Assyrians. Their capital city was a city called Nineveh. And they had uh, 
gone out like many kings in that day did, and they had invaded other kingdoms. And the ten northern tribes, we're going to call those Israel, that's what they were called, all right? They, because of their idolatry, the Assyrians came in, and God, here's the word, allowed them to be taken captive. They were defeated. They lost. And because of that, the children of Israel were taken away and put in other kingdoms. And they took people from other kingdoms and brought them into Israel from as far away as Babylon. And there they were living there. I think it's kind of funny and humorous that even though the Israel, those northern tribes who were rebellious, this is what God did. When those other pagan people came in, God just started devastating the place. And they said, we can't live like this. So uh, the king of Assyria, his name was Shennacherib, he, he came in and said, well, we'll bring some priest from the old Jews because uh, God is the God of those, that place, and we'll let him, we'll let the priest teach them about the God of that land. Didn't work either. I think God laughed at them because they were, they were uh, I, I, uh, people of idolatry as well. So here we see the Assyrians coming in. And Hezekiah, I mean, the enemy's coming. I mean, he knows what's next. So he tries to make a treaty with the Assyrians and King Shennacherib. He, he went in, get this now, he went to the temple. And he stripped the temple of all of its silver and its gold. Can you believe that? That should have been sacred. He should have never done that. But he did, and he took, the, he took the gold and the silver, and he gave it to the Assyrians and said, leave us alone. So they said, sure, we'll leave you alone. But see, he, he was coming from the north. He went through Israel. He got to Judah. They bribed him. So then his next move was to go down to Egypt and defeat them. But Shennacherib got to thinking about it. He says, hold on. I'm fighting a battle in the south, but I'm leaving an enemy to the north on my weak front flank. And he said, I, I can't do that. Now, I'll take their gold and I'll take their silver. But he went back to them and he said, hold on. Open the gates of Jerusalem and let me in. I won't do you like I did to Israel. I made them leave the country. I'll let you stay, but understand now, you're going to have to serve me. You'll get to tend your lands and you'll get to do that, but you still have to let me serve. I'll leave my people here that, and they will be in charge. And Hezekiah was a godly man. Please hear this. Good king. Godly man. And he's like, I'm not going to do it. What would you think if in the darkest of times and the enemy's coming against you, you're just going to open up the gates and say, just come on in. Take what you want. Do what you want. I don't think so, do you? And Hezekiah said, no, enough is enough. You can have the silver, you can have the gold, but you cannot do that to us. So then we find out exactly what happened. If you've got your Bible and you want to follow along, I want to give you a little bit of the background story. So if you, if you want to, it's in 2 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 19. It says, then the Rabshakeh, now that's the, the, the spokesman for the king of Assyria. He said to them, and by the way, he's on the outside of the, the walls of Jerusalem. He's got 185,000 soldiers. They've surrounded Jerusalem. That looks pretty bleak, right? And he's yelling out to them, speaking to them in Hebrew so all of them can hear. And he says, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this in which you trust? You speaking of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. He's mocking them. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. He said, are you trusting in Egypt to save you? So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him? But listen to what he says in verse 22. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Is it not he whose high places and whose altar Hezekiah has taken away? 
and said to Judah in Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? He said, hold on. Hezekiah took down all these idols. Yeah, the false, false worship. He took it all down. He even took down, y'all remember when uh, the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and they got out in the wilderness and because of their sin, these serpents came and bit them and the people were dying. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it up on a pole and he said, whosoever believes and looks up to it, they will be healed. Y'all remember that? People were healed. But here's the thing. They were looking at this thing, this brazen serpent of the past where God had brought great victory and they even began to worship that. And God says, even that is an idol and I don't want that. So even Hezekiah took that away. All the places where they were worshiping all these other gods, the temple was secure, but all these other things he had torn down because he was a godly man. Look what it says in verse number 25. Have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, he's quoting Jehovah God as if he could speak for God. He said, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. He's acting as if God has told him and he's telling them that. That's a lie. But how many of you know Satan's a liar? Satan will try to get you to believe his lie. And if you do believe the lie, he's won. Look in verse number 28. Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from, the, from his hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. The city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyrians. Do not listen to Hezekiah. That's what he was saying. Do not listen to Hezekiah. Look what he says in the end of verse 32. Do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. His battle plan was to get them not to trust in God. His battle plan was to say, Hey, we've defeated everybody else. What makes you think we're not going to defeat you? Just look out. See the army? 185,000 people surrounding the, by the way, very small city of Jerusalem. The walled city there. Common sense would say, open the doors. At least we won't die. And yet they were saying, we must trust in God. They were, they were mocking, saying, are you saying you're trusting the Lord God? No other God's ever defeated us. What makes you think your God will? It was to this that the 46th Psalm was written. It was during this time that somebody, I believe under the inspiration of God, penned the words that would come from a true heart, looking at the perfect God, and as a child of God, the one thing that they should do, needs to do, must do, we must do, is in the times of trouble, look to God for help. In the times of difficulty, do not stand in your strength, stand in Him. When everything seems bleak, when everything, when it looks like God is allowing this to happen, please understand, God will be faithful to himself and to those who follow him. You can trust him. Look at the very beginning of this psalm in Psalms 46. He says there, The Lord is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. God, the Lord, Elohim, he is our refuge. He is our shelter. If you're in, out in the midst of a storm, I mean, and the storm just comes to you, what's the first thing you're going to do? Run for shelter. Amen? Can I say to you, that's the wisest thing that you could do? But how many times when we go through the storms of life and the difficulties of there, we will stand out and say, no, I'm in charge. What I think matters. I ignore this storm, hold on, 
God says, run to the shelter. But he says, Elohim, our Lord, our master, our savior, he is our shelter. He is our strength. When you find it, when you find the place that you're out of strength, that's when you're going to find your strength. When you become weak, then you can become strong. Hey, look what he says there at the end of verse one. He says, a very present help in trouble. When you need him, He's there. The word trouble there means in the tight places. Y'all ever been in a corner? You ever been shut up in a corner by troubles and trials and hardships? When things look bleak? When things look like the ungodly are winning? Come on, just let it sink in a little bit. Look around. When the people that you don't like, the people that you don't agree with, when it looks like they're winning, what you going to do? What shelter are you going to run to? When you find yourself out of strength and in a tight place, what are you going to do? You see, I think we all get to that place. And when you're there and you need help, aren't you grateful you've got someone to call out to? Aren't you grateful that you've got someone that's there that listens? Look what he says in verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. When you're in trouble, what's the first thing that comes? Fear. I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose it all. It's over. It's done. I have no hope. Fear is the opposite of faith. Amen? But it either fear will outwin, out... I'll make sure I'll say this exactly right. Fear will overcome our faith, or faith in God will release the power of God and overcome our fear. Which one's going to win? Don't fear. We've got a God. We've got a God who's powerful and in charge. Look what it says in verse 2. Even though the earth be removed, the word earth there means land. The word remove means change. Listen now, even though the land be changed. Things are changing nowadays, aren't they? Things have changed and it doesn't look, you may not like the changes. You may not like the things that are going on. Matter of fact, you may be wondering why in the world God's allowing some of the changes that are happening right now to change. You may say, it looks like evil is winning over good. But yet he says, we're not going to fear because even though the land be removed and the mountains be cast, carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. You know, when think about a, 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 a body of water when the winds are blowing against it and the waves are crashing and everything looks like it's out of place. Remember the, when Jesus was with his disciples in the little fishing boat and they were going across and Jesus was tired? And he, he fell asleep. And remember when the waves were coming against it, and he's saying that, that, that all the disciples are saying, we're going to sink. And they went and they woke up Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to sink. Don't you care? Jesus, first of all, said, oh, ye of little faith, because fear had overcome their faith. But then he said, Peace, be still. Literally, he said, hush, be calm. And those waves that were going like this, when the wind stopped and the waves ceased, and they're left in the boat with the Son of God, who has power over the storms of life. Wonder what they felt then. He says, do not fear, do not fear. Though the lands be changed, though the mountains be carried in, into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, no matter what storm you're going through, our Lord is our refuge and our strength, a help in time of trouble. So don't be fearful. There's a word in the Hebrew there. It's S-E-L-A-H, Selah. 
Now, you probably won't remember anything else I had to say this morning, but this is the one thing I hope you remember. The word Selah means, wow. What do you think about that? And they're saying, hey, as long as God is in control, it doesn't matter what's outside Jerusalem's walls. It doesn't matter how big the army is. It doesn't matter how big the waves of the circumstances and the storms of life are coming. It doesn't matter how troubled and how squeezed in I feel. It doesn't matter how small I feel. It doesn't matter how much the lands be changed and how much the mountains are removed. Peace be still. I imagine one of the disciples in that boat that day when Jesus calmed it, and it was just as tranquil and as quiet as could be. One of them might have looked up and said, hey, Matt, wow, what do you think about that? In the midst of the storm, we need to have a say law in our life. We don't need to have a, oh, woe is me, for I am undone. He's worthy of our praise no matter the storm. He is high and lifted up on the throne. Matter of fact, right where he needs to be, right where he should be. He says, Selah. Look in verse 4. There's a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. I like this. He is talking about in the city of Jerusalem, Hezekiah had done something special. Outside the wall, there was a, a spring of uh, Gihon. And he had gone to this spring of Gihon, and he had, he had built a tunnel, a conduit, underground, that went underneath the city walls. And he had taken the water from the spring of Gihon, and he had brought that, come on now, a fresh spring water and brought it right inside the city. The enemy said, 185,000, we'll just surround them until they run out of food and run out of clean water, and, and they'll just be opening the door. We'll never have to do anything. They'll just invite us in just to give us an escape. But they took it 1,777 feet long, and they had disguised it and covered it up. So the enemy didn't even know it was there. There, but what that what, what what was there? Fresh water. Look what the psalmist said here. There's a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the most the holy place of the tabernacle of, of the Most High. God is in the midst of her; she shall not be moved. God shall keep her, just at the break of dawn. When I was thinking about this, my heart could not help but go back and think of John seven. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Anybody thirsty? Come to me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow what? Rivers of living water. When you're encased and in your, the troubles are against you, and everything seems bleak and dark and dreary, come on now. He is placed by the power of the Holy Spirit, a fountain that will flow within you, a fountain of refreshing water. When you're hot and you're dry and you're thirsty and the craving for water is there, it, wouldn't it be just so wonderful to go get a, a, a fresh glass of water? Matter of fact, I got some right here. I mean, I brought it from the well of Stevens. Amen? This is not Gainesville City water. This is the water from home. Can I get an amen on that? That's right. What do you think about that? You know, Jesus said, if any man hears my voice in Revelation 3.20 and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You see, we carry, that, we carry the resource with us. And it doesn't matter the circumstance because our resource is greater he is there for us. He is, the, he is the unending supply. But look what else happens there. Look in verse number five. 
He is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Now keep your finger in Psalms 46, but I want to go back to 2 Kings, and I want to share, share with you what happened. This is in the 19th chapter and the 35th verse. Y'all listening? And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out. God in heaven said, enough. Hey, angel, 17 trillion, 96 billion, 493 million, 822,743, or Leroy, come here. I got a job for you. Go down there to Jerusalem. You see that army? I don't, I'm tired of them. Handle it. Look what it says in verse 35. It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. One word from a holy God is greater than 800, one, 185,000 enemies. Can I get an amen? When you feel outnumbered and in a tight place, one plus God is still a majority. And he says, and when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. By the way, I prefer my corpses dead, don't you? <laughs> Amen? Everywhere they looked, dead soldiers. Everywhere they looked, defeat. Everywhere they looked, praise to a holy God. Praise to a holy God who comes through. He's there. He's with them. He is the ever-present help. An angel of the Lord is with them. Look what he says in verse number 7 of Psalms 46. The Lord of hosts, that means the Lord of all, is with us. I-M-M-A-U, which is the root of the word that we get, Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Lord of all is with us. The Lord that is sitting on the throne in heaven, the Lord, is with us. When you go to face the battles of the day, the God of the universe is with you. The God of angel armies is with you. The God who can command good out of bad is with you. Now, I don't know if that blesses you, but it blesses me. He says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word refuge there is the same word in verse 7 as it is in verse 11, but it's a different word than in verse 1. In verse 1, it means a shelter. But here it means a stronghold or literally a high tower. When they would build those walled cities, they would go to the, to the corner, the high place, and they would build the high tower there to show the greatest of strength. He's saying God's are. High tower. And by the way, wow. What do you think about that? Look what he says in verse number eight. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Don't you know that morning when they woke up and the army was dead all around them, everybody said, hey, you got to come see this for yourself. And people who had heard and, and, and the horses all around them and the battle cries and the noise of the enemy always there, the fires that were coming up from the enemy there, looking so strong. Now they ran out, and all they saw was need of a great big funeral. Amen? Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. Doesn't the enemy always look strong right before it falls? He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. God can do that. By the way, what is that called? You ready for it? Peace. Shalom. Peace. 
He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Look in verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. When Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and, and the waves and the storms were coming and everything looked as bleak and as dreary and that little bitty boat looked like it was about to go down, Jesus said, peace, be still. Literally, hush, be calm. And the storm, come on now, the storm, I hope you're hearing this, the storm had no choice but to go away. And when they stood there, they stood in peace. But let me ask you, in the storms of life, are your, is your heart going here and there? Has fear come in and doubt? Are you worried? When it looks like there's no hope, when it looks like it's the bleakest that it can be, he is saying, be still and know. Experientially know. You'll never know it any other way. Know that I am God. Can I ask you a question? What would have happened if God answered Hezekiah's first prayer? I mean, he watched Israel be defeated. And now words come to him from Sennacherib that they're next. Instead of stripping the gold and the silver from the temple of a holy God, what if they had revival in the temple of the holy God? Instead of being wearied down and worried because of the size of the enemy, what if they saw that there was a holy God? What if God had answered their first prayer? Then it would have been like, God's worth nothing except to be our 911. Y'all know what 911 is? When you're in danger and you're in need of help and someone, you need someone to come help you, you go call 911 and the sirens will roar, will, will roar and the speed of those ambulances and the fire trucks and, the, and, and, and all of those things will come to bring comfort and aid in a difficult time. But so many of us, we look to God as our 911. And how many of you take 911 for granted? I mean, you know it's there, but you don't think about it every day. Matter of fact, you're very good with living your life the way you want it, but if something comes up, you're grateful there's a 911. But God doesn't want to just be a 911 kind of God. He wants to be an everyday kind of God. He wants that river of life to come flowing out of your heart every day. You see, sometimes God allows troubles. Allows. Sometimes he allows difficulties to come. Hardship to come. Where is your worship going to be then? It's easy to shout when you're on the mountaintop. It's easy to shout when all the things are turning wonderful and great and, and all the world's behind you and all the love is there and, and it couldn't get any better. Oh, we can have some worship service then. We can come here and sing and we can pray and we can give out of our abundance and everything is wonderful. But let the crutch be knocked out from under us. Let the bills pile up. It happens. Doesn't it happen? I got a call this week. A friend of mine called me and said, Brother Brian, and I, I had known he had been in the hospital. Y'all heard, heard a hurricane? Did we have a hurricane? He was in the hospital with a heart attack during the hurricane. He was without power, get this now, eight days. We were probably not out eight minutes. But he was without power for eight days. He left the hospital, came home. No power still. 
And everything that he had in his refrigerator and his freezer were gone. I did his wife's funeral about two, this January will be two years ago. And he says, Pastor, I have nothing. He said, I'm trying to just make a way until the first of the month when I get my check again. Y'all know how that feels? You remember how dark and bleak it was? By the way, he's in the hospital today. He went in last night with shortness of breath. We were texting this morning. But I tell you what, God always comes through. We got him gas, we got him food. He'll be fine. But you know what blesses me? This is the former preacher, Brother Bradley, who has nothing of this world left. Nothing of this world left. But he's still got a river of living water within him. There's nothing that our God can't do. Have you found bleakness? Yes. But in the midst of it, be still and know that he is God. That he is able. Be still and know that God hadn't lost out on anything. And I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the land. The Lord of hosts, Emmanuel, God is right here. The Lord of Jacob is my stronghold. Usually, we know the storm will end. But we're scared about what's going to happen during the storm. How many of you, when the, the hurricane came through a week or two ago, you heard those winds? And I know some of you, the trees fell pretty close. Amen? We can testify in this room. They fell pretty close. But we knew the storm was going to be gone. We just didn't know the devastation that it would leave behind. In all of the anxiousness of life, we just need to be still. Not fretful and worried. But no, God's got this. In just a second, we're going to have our invitation hymn. It's going to be a little different today. One of my favorite artists is named Stephen Curtis Chapman. And he took the scripture of Psalms 46, and he put it into words. And I want you to allow this during this time. Uh, as you hear these words, and I want you to think about the storms of your life. And there may be times, too, that during this invitation you want to stand. One of the lines of this song is we need to stand in awe of him. And you may want to join that too. I'm going to pray a prayer and then we're going to have this song of invitation. I don't care what your trouble is. Actually, I do care. But I'm just here to tell you it's not greater than our God. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Lord, you know what's going on in the world better than we do. And Lord, I proclaim you got this. So, Lord, may the fears of my life and the, and the stirring of my spirit, may it be quietened. And, Lord, may I stand in awe in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.